stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, it's Joan Quinn. Welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here in this historic Max Factor building where the Hollywood Museum lives, and we're happy to be here. So our guests today are filmmaker, foster quarter, and photographer Matthew Ralston. Veteran filmmaker Foster Corder was born in Chicago, where he attended St. Cyril's Chicago Vocational High School and the Chicago Academy of Fine Art. He also went to the Rhode Island Naval War College, and we have to find out why. <laughs> but the great thing is, after all that schooling, he had a scholarship to USC's Cosby Screenwriting Program. And USC is like, the best yeah. film school because I went to SC. Yeah. And so, and you went there. Yes. And my daughter went. She <laughs> did just, she go yeah, there too? She just okay. So it. we're the SC family. Um, how did that um, life of yours, which is like so diverse, come about when you were a baby on the road? Yeah. You started uh, as a baby on the road, uh, a right? Ro a road baby, yes. My yeah, what was, was that? A horn player. Oh, he was. Uh, a jazz musician, and my mother was the manager of the band. Well, wasn't that smart? Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, and so I was born in St. Louis, and um, so probably two days afterwards, we left. And I was so you were on the road? Chicago. Yes. And yeah. where, would, where did they play? What kind of clubs? Um, jazz clubs. You know, it was the 50s. So, there were a lot of jazz clubs, weren't yeah, there? Yeah, that was, or bars that was or? the time. Exactly, exactly. You know, juke joints and taverns and all that kind of stuff. And she just, and, and how many people were in the group? I think they had like a six-piece band. Oh, they did? Yeah. So it was big. Wow. They were yeah. like big. But yeah, for that time, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you went to all these schools, and I think that that Rhode Island Naval War Colleges. Yeah. What was that? Uh, well, I studied navigation and weather there. Um, and that came about because I forged my birth certificate when I was 15. Oh, yeah. Tell us that story. To, uh, to, to, <laughs> to, well, it's not really artistic, but it's, it's my, my it's story. It's your story. Yeah. <laughs> um, I grew up in a neighborhood that was kind of difficult because uh, my mother worked three jobs to keep us in Catholic school. And uh, there was a street gang headquarters right next door. So we would come home from school in our starch shirts and ties. Oh, nice. And then i have to go to the store to get a loaf of bread, and I'd have to fight for, to keep the change on the way back. And uh. I'd come back with the bread just in the bag with no brown paper bag because it was Cause they all the jumped. On, they and, jumped you? Yeah, oh, so, little boy. Yeah, so it was interesting. And so in order to get away from the street gang, um, I forged my birth certificate and talked for my friends who were old enough to go into the service. And so Is we that to, right? Yes. To get away from that life? Yes, because uh, my mother had gotten me a job at uh, J. Walter Heller at the time. And um, color Xerox machines had just come out. And I was working in the mail room, so I ordered the paper and everything from, and made a birth certificate. Oh my gosh, the, you the, really the, did! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Took it to the recruiter, um, and I took the GED because I was a sophomore still in high school. Uh -huh. uh, got a three eight or a four zero on the GED. Because you went to good Catholic school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> With the nuns picking me up by my ears. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and. And so I went to the Navy because those guys, they beat me up one day and uh, like 21 guys hog tied me, tied my hands behind my back to my feet. And, and so I passed out for lack of blood on the way home and woke up in the hospital and oh. said, this is over. So I went to St. Louis until the recruiter got me 
to be able to lead. Oh, that's why you went to the academy? That's where the academy yes, took you? Yes, yes. Oh, that's very yes. interesting. But then you became a photographer. Yes. With the, <laughs> I think yes. this is so great, with, for animals. Yes. Um, well, after I came back from Vietnam, I used my GI Bill to go to the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts. Oh, that's to, when you did it. Yeah, to study art and photography and, and film. And I didn't want to do fashion. I was, I was shooting models. It was a lot of money in that, you know, at the time. But I was just so sick of the whole, all the women and the same thing, you know, over and over. And so I wanted to do something different. <laughs> And I looked at the animal photography thing, and I saw that there weren't a lot of them. As actually, it was only one guy really doing it commercially at the time. And I talked to him on the phone, and he said, yeah, yeah it's been great for me. So did you go with him as an intern, or you no, just started yourself? No, he was in Massachusetts. He oh, was in oh, upstate oh. Massachusetts. I so I just started. I opened Foster's Pet and Animal Photography um, on 87th <laughs> Street in Chicago. Did you? Yeah. And that's got a lot of publicity. Uh, Popular photography, Chicago Tribune, Chicago really? Times. A lot of people because were because of the animal shots you were taking. Yes, and yes. they were mostly cats. I think you said oh, right. Oh, no, it was no, everything. Oh, it was yeah, everything. I, I was, and I mean, the, the cat thing was. It was one woman. It was the first time in my life I had ever seen an attack cat. Uh, this lady had a cat that had to be twenty pounds, and oh. he was huge. <laughs> and but he would attack on command. It was the most incredible thing I ever seen, you know, and so um, that cat, but I shot dogs and then Carnation sponsored me. I would go around to dog shows with all my photographs and, uh, oh. up and I would have a booth. And, Is that uh, right? Yeah. And yeah. then how did the animals sit? Were they good or were they like people? Or how uh, would, it, the, how would yeah, you that, keep their attention? Well, I had a couple of techniques. The main, it was two things mainly. Uh, one was liver sausage, you oh. know, and the <laughs> second one was I had a Moog synthesizer. So my assistant would hit a button, a key, off camera, and the sounds would go, wah, 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 and the dog would pose, and wee, 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 And then you'd and go then, like that? Yeah, and I'd motor You would just camera. be sh shooting while the mo yes. Oh, that's so yes. great, really? Yeah. yeah. And, and then what'd you do with the liver? Oh, well, it was Did back you in the refrigerator. Yeah, oh, with the liver yeah, for commercials. You, yeah. For commercial, like the bags for uh, uh Back in the refrigerator. Can. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. <a> good one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the Calcan company, yeah. those dog food bags, I would take <laughs> the liver sausage and rub it around the kids. See, because they say the two hardest things to do is shoot kids and animals. I know, that's why I'm asking you. Put both of them together. Yeah. So, so I would have the uh, dog owners not feed the dog, you know, the night before, oh, the right. day before, so when he would come to the studio, he would... So that was him. one trick, don't yes. feed him. Yes, yeah, definitely, because there's nothing worse than a hungry dog on set. I mean, a full dog, you know. Oh, because um, then they don't listen to you at all. They don't pay attention, you know, so... Um, that did you was like weird. animals? I loved animals. Oh, you always. did, so that yeah. was great. Yeah, it was... I was weird in my neighborhood because, you know, it was predominantly, uh, you know, a black neighborhood, and... You know, we went to Catholic school. I liked Elvis Presley, and I liked dogs. So that made me totally... You were really out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so. But those were some of your tricks. The Moog, yeah. don't yes. feed your dog, yes. and use some liver. Liver sausage, yes. Or, and, and, and then you had these great clients. You had um, Cal... Oh, Cal Can and Carnation, yes. Yeah. Yeah, they, they were great commercial clients. And then... Uh, it was something so new that a lot of people just started, you know, calling me and they would see the sign on my storefront oh. and come by and get their animals photographed. Oh, that then, I was going to say, uh, then private yeah. portraits, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then that led to uh, photographing horses. I, I was going to ask you, race horses you yeah, photographed. Yeah, race horses. Uh, and that was fun because uh, a lot of wealthy people, you know, when, when oh, you yeah. talk about horses. Where'd you, you know, go? Did you go on location with your no, horse? Oh, yeah, you had to. Go on location, yeah. <laughs> you couldn't bring yeah. the horses, yeah. could you? Yeah, and that, well, that was fun, though. All over the South to those yeah. wonderful? Yeah, well, mainly in the Midwest. It in was, the Midwest? Yeah, yeah. And then when I came west to California, it was all about movies. Yes, you that. changed. Then you just gave that up and you, you, you founded Blackbird Films. Yes, and because I, I discovered that uh, there weren't any African-American-owned commercial production companies. Oh, and that's I, what that was? Yeah, and I, I thought see. that was really 
you know, strange and warm, right? So I saw opportunity. But then and, you put together teams of people. Yes. For your for your big clients. Yes. Yes. So I, each client like got a different team of, of that's director right. and yes. celebrity or whatever. Yes, I had um, Michael Peters was one of my directors. God bless his soul. Um, um, Gordon Parks, which Gordon was my Parks, idol, I know? can't it's believe like it. Was, it. But he had never been asked to do commercials before. Oh. You know, so there. And Forrest yeah, Whitaker. Good, Forrest Whitaker. Um, Kevin Hooks, right. a lot of people, Helene Head, a lot of people who are big now, and then. So I, they came in as directors yes. of what you were doing for yes. your um, for, for your and, commercial. And I got clients like McDonald's, Coca Cola, California yeah. Lotto, and. Did Louis they Center. act in it too? Any of them? No, no. They didn't Sinbad, act. Sinbad and BB King were the only ones oh. that acted in things. Uh, Sinbad did the uh, Mac Rib commercial, and BB King, uh, we did the classic uh, Mac Chicken. That every time BB King gets ill. They'll put it on CNN, that commercial, I guess. It's and so it's CNN. Blackbird Films did that? Yes. Fantastic. Yes. So um, then you worked with NBA great Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt Chamberlain. How did that, yes. what was that about? Uh, the, what was was that part of this group? Yes, no, that was different. It's that separate. was Yes, that was, uh, I played pro racquetball for a couple of years. And it's not basketball, though. No, and <laughs> I was the teaching pro at the Santa Monica Athletic Club. And <laughs> Wilt came there one day oh. and he saw me playing and um, you know and we kind of hit it off you know and so it started with the racquetball and then he found out that I was really a filmmaker and and it just proceeded so we so you made a Wilt. you made a documentary with him yes it's called the amazing feats of Wilt Chamberlain and uh, we traveled the world together for 17 years you know he and I you know doing things I put him. I did the deal for him to be in Conan because Wilt never wanted to be an actor all of those years. He wanted to, but if you know anything about Wilt Chamberlain, you know, he was all about the ladies. And he did not want to be an actor because he said when he was coming up, you know, the black guy could never get the girl. <laughs> so you know? he would never get it so, in the film. <laughs> yeah, so he didn't want to be in movies. But so, maybe he could have changed that. <laughs> right, right. So we did Conan. We went to uh, Mexico. Mexico. And did that with Arnold. Grace Jones was Grace down there. Jones, I was down right. there. You were? I was in Mexico City. There was oh. an earthquake when you were down there. That's right. There. <laughs> exactly. That's uh, exactly. Because we were at Chulabusco Studios. And, um, and the right. weapon, I designed the weapon that he has. In, in oh, movies. you did? Yeah. They, we call, it's called the bombata stick because oh, when, we, uh -huh. yeah, when we got there uh, they gave him a sword it's one of these long curvy swords and he had a scene where he had to fight Conan and I was like wait a minute you can't fight Conan with a little skinny sword like that you know and Conan's sword is huge and he does that muscle thing that Arnold does. So what you did know? you do? You built uh, this went, big thing? Yeah, I, I went to the prop shop and stayed up all night to uh, just you know, putting something together and ended up with a, it's a, a metal pipe with uh, fur around it and I took some spikes <laughs> and put it on a ball and took an axe blade and turned it upside oh, down. Oh, that's what. And it had spikes on one side and uh, axe a axe blade? blade on the other side and it was huge and Oh, it was it. great. It was, yeah, it's called was it heavy? Plastic. Was it like, was it heavy? Or well, was it, it like? It was, it was plastic. So it, that's what it, I wonder, yeah, but it yeah. just looked like it was really. Exactly. I remember because Grace Jones was on the same floor with us. And when the building started shaking, she ran to the window and she went, where is the helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> she that's wanted the helicopter to save her. Yeah, yeah, that was it, really interesting yeah, fun, no, wasn't was, it? That's amazing. What about Daughters to Feed Productions? Daughters to Feed. Uh, I Did mean, we finish Black? Yeah. Bird yes, films yes, yes, and that's yes, finished yes, and now you yes. started Daughters to yes. Feed? Uh, after, yes, because <laughs> after I made all the noise in the commercial uh, industry, um, you know, the other commercial companies that didn't have any Latinos or blacks or women directors, they started getting directors and slowly they kind of pushed us out a little bit. Uh, so I, yeah, I, because I, once you establish yourself, right. then somebody else moves in. That's right. That's right. So. <laughs> I, uh, I left there and went to Capitol Records where I was head of production there and produced a, a lot of the Hammer videos, Tina Turner, Poison, Great White Palm. I know, Park, Tina Turner, stuff. you yeah. did all that yeah. stuff. And video I, productions, you yes, were the head video. of the video yes, productions yes, director. Yes, yes. and um, so then I started Blackbird Films when Capitol did a worldwide cutback. I mean, uh, um, I started uh, Daughters, Daughters to Feed Films. Right. 
And, uh, and I named it Daughters to Feed because I have two daughters, Courtney uh, and Pilar. And so those one, are the two. <laughs> yes. Uh, and the one that just graduated from USC in um, um, biology major. And um, so, and Daughters to Feed is my production company, which is now I'm doing my current film, which going back to the animal photography <gasps> is uh, Conversations with a Pit Bull. Is that right? Yes. Did you write it? Yes, I wrote it. And it's... Uh, it's t about 10 dogs on death row in the dog pound, and they're talking to each other. It's sort of a look who's talking meets the green mile for dogs. So this goes back to your scholarship at, yeah. at SC and yes. that Bill Cosby That's gave right. that scholarship. And That's it's right. it's taken how many years? 30 years yeah. of working? Yeah, of working, yeah. Till now, That's right. you're back well, to Mr. writing? Well, Mr. Cosby said, um, write what you know. Yes. You know, and so... What I know, and then I had cancer, and I was hospitalized for two years. I couldn't work uh, about three years ago. And so now, you know, having looked at life and saying, you know, you've had a great life, you've been blessed, what is it that you really want to do? And going back to my dog roots is what I wanted to do. Oh, so, so that's what yeah. you did. So yeah. then, um, but you also made a faith-based film. Yes, I made two. Uh, one I produced called Lord Help Us and with Margaret Avery um, in that. And uh, the one, uh, my last film is called Church. Oh, it was. Uh, yes, that Church was... the movie. And with uh, Art Evans and uh, Joseph C. Phillips and uh, Darius McCary and a um, bunch of friends came together to make it. It's a nice, it's a musical. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah, I've written another musical, uh, faith-based musical that distributors want, but but Conversations with a Pit Bull is first. Time. That's coming up first. Well, we're so glad you came and you gave Thank us you. this whole 30-year history. Yes. Thank you for having me. And you me. put a lot That's of so great sweet. names in between yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Foster. And don't go away. We'll be right back with photographer Matthew Ralston. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're here at the Hollywood Museum taping and we're so thankful to be here we love it and i have matthew ralston photographer who was born and raised in los angeles i met matthew when i was the west coast editor of interview magazine and he was one of our dependable creative young very young <laughs> photographers uh, he went on to work at numerous new york based publications like vanity fair w GQ, Esquire, um, Harper's Bazaar, and Vogue. And you did nearly 100 covers for um, Rolling Stone. How could you do 100 covers? What, how are you creative enough to change that and make it interesting? Oh, I'm so lucky to get to do what I do. And uh, you know, it's the people that make it. I'm a portrait photographer, and uh, it's working with those people. It's always collaborative. That's what makes it exciting. Why, were, why did you decide to be a photographer? Oh, you know, I was uh, studying painting and illustration since a very early years, like six, seven years old. And about age 16, I got very intrigued by fashion. And I thought I wanted to be a fashion illustrator. Oh, fabulous, right? Antonio. <laughs> yeah, they were, I was very inspired by that era. This was in the 70s. And uh, one of the classes that I was taking uh, you had to use photography to photograph uh, drapery of fabric against different kinds of lighting oh. and learn how to render in pencil, say, uh, raw silk with sunlight on it. Right. And so I had a friend of mine, uh, Patty is her name, with beautiful clothes and a beautiful woman, agreed to, you know, allow me to photograph her. I was just a student. And those photographs interested me much more than drawing. And why was it? What, what was it about it that just jumped out at you? I think it was a sense of ease. You know, I had friends mm. in school who could draw like writing a sentence. It would just mm -hmm. float out of them. If I drew, I had to rework it and uh. work and work. And it was just not really that natural, even though I enjoyed doing it. Photography, for, photography for me had that ease. Did you have a camera? I, <laughs> Did you have your own camera at that time? I had a, 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 a Nikromat, which is a, a cheap Nikon that I'd gotten in high school. Uh -huh. And where was it. high school? High school was Fairfax High School. And then you LA. went to Art Center? No, where'd you go after uh, that? Well, I went to Art Center actually throughout my childhood because I took classes there. Art Center is a wonderful college here in Los Angeles. It's now in Pasadena. Uh, I studied, oh. yeah, I studied uh, drawing and painting there as a child. They had classes on Wednesday nights and Saturdays for kids. <laughs> 
And I went to the high school program when I was in junior high, so I was kind of lucky. Uh, and uh, then I went there for photography. And 10 years later, I went back to study film for a year oh. when I became a director. And then 10 years after that, I established a scholarship at Art Center for film and photo. Oh, that's great. It's wonderful to have that follow through and to be familiar with the same place and do something for some for an institution that did something for you, really. I, arts, I feel like I've been going to Art Center my entire life. Well, you have. <laughs> I have. And I still do because I mentor. I now added mentoring to my scholarship. So. Oh, do they bring you into the um, photography classes to talk to the students? No, actually, it's, it's, it's different than that. And by the way, sometimes it's photo, sometimes it's film majors. They come to me. Oh, they, they come to your studio? They come to my studio. They visit my shoots. Sometimes they make documentary films as a way of learning about what I'm doing. And it's just been a great exchange, actually. Oh, that's so great. Um, you said that it's the person that makes the photograph for you. The mm -hmm. person makes it interesting. But you still have to have some direction from the publication. When you went to work for us at Interview, what did they tell you to do? Well, Interview was unusual because it was extremely free of agenda. Uh, they just gave me the assignment. And it was up to me to come up with the approach. And my approach then is the same as it is now. You have to start with research. You need to get to know the subject and be able to make a kind of comment through the visual. You were very young then. How did you figure that out? I mean, we were, interview was like a, a, a bedroom for young photographers, wasn't it? I mean, it was really great. I think interview at that moment uh, was a, a, a really important moment for Los Angeles because Andy discovered three photographers, three young photographers in L.A. It was myself, Herb Ritz, and a man named Greg Gorman. That's right, all three of you. And that was the beginning. And I worked with all of you, which was great. And you all did photographs of me. You did portraits. <laughs> it's yes, fabulous. Yeah. And your beautiful daughters. And my daughters, yeah, but that was for interview. That mm -hmm. was an assignment for interview. So you just were free to do as you wanted. Yeah, pretty much. So. It and was, was it always black and white? Uh, Gee, it's hard for me to remember. I think so. I think the covers were illustrated. Yes, by uh, uh, Richard Bernstein. By Richard Bernstein on, on the top of the photography, but inside was black and white. And this really created uh, an influential movement towards black and white photography at that period and uh, an incredible interest in celebrity photography. As usual, Andy was way ahead of the curve. We were way ahead, weren't we? I mean, uh, everything that went on there, Robert Hayes, who was choosing the photographers and choosing the how to crop and what to do. But then say when you worked for Vogue, what kind of, uh, what did they tell you to do if they gave you an assignment? Well, that would be much more directed. That's what Absolutely. I mean. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, uh, and it might not even be something that I particularly wanted to do, but I'd find uh, a way to make it mine. I see. Uh, I mean, you take the opportunity as it comes. And especially as a young photographer, you're grateful for, for so any opportunity. Is it about clothes? It would be about clothes, or would it be about a, uh, a personality? Well, everything I do is about personalities. Although I use fashion, I'm by no means a fashion photographer. But yes, it would be about a certain Vogue aesthetic. Not just the clothes, but the way the makeup was done, the type mm. of lighting. They would insist perhaps on natural light uh, and to go outside, where at that period I was more interested in lighting things and being in the studio. Right. So it wasn't always a perfect fit. But were you, did you do, um, we'll get on to Oprah now. I was going to ask you, GQ is probably the same as Vogue, right? Directed, mm -hmm. telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. But what about Oprah? You, you shot her 33 times. What do you do with somebody that you sh to, to make it different? Well, first of all, Oprah has a, a team around her, a creative director, a brilliant man named Adam Glassman. And oh. they, you know Adam? Yes. Yeah, he's a great guy. And they come pr prepared with many ideas. And then it's an exchange between me and the, and the creative director and the other people on their staff. So you do have your input? Oh, absolutely. Yep. It's an But then to do it 33 times, different ways, different shots? Uh, you no, know, I think it's harder on Oprah than it was on me. <laughs> I mean, she's fascinating. I think she's maybe a little bit tired of the process, but uh, she could be a model. She could be a lot of things. She's so gifted. She can just do anything. At that time, were you using Photoshop? Were you using touch-ups? What were you doing? Because now, every, you don't know what the photograph is. You don't know if, who's touched it and what's happened to it. Well, in the, grand tradition of, <laughs> in the grand tradition of Hollywood portraiture, I've always employed retouching and enhancement. Uh, and by the way, I think the day after photography was invented, retouching came along. Yes, they were using them in the 30s and 40s, weren't they, in at the, the studios? Yeah. As well. So I think that uh, idealization of the image has always been a part of my practice. 
Uh, it's in the tradition mm. of great portrait painting, of society portraits, etc. Uh, Highly so idealized imagery of, 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 of individuals. So you believe in that? I'm a romantic, That's and right. I look at people uh, and I want to dream about them. But then in the meantime, you found Talking Heads, the Vent Haven portraits. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. You look at this, this book weighs a ton, first of all. It's very heavy. It's very beautiful. It's, Thank you. I think the way it's been mounted and the paper and everything about it is beautiful. How did you find the Van Haven Museum? Well, we're in year four of this particular project, and this is my... Year four? Year four. This is my first ever venture into fine art. Uh, I mean, many people over the years have said, oh, we love your photography. What's your personal work? And I would say, well, this is it. This is personal enough. Right. A lot of me goes into this. Right. But I arrived at a certain point in my life, maybe it has to do with just my own aging process, where I thought, you know, it's time to do things that I just want to do, and I had the luxury of doing that, and to fund those things. So uh, this was a chance for me to give myself an assignment. So how did you find it? I'm the kind of person that when I, I have a creative issue or problem to solve, the answer presents itself to me. The universe um. <laughs> delivers to me the thing that I need just when I need it. I'm, I'm really blessed. And so I was casting about for a personal project, reading the New York Times as I do. Uh, happened upon an article uh, four years ago by Edward Rothstein. Edward is a, uh, Mr. Rothstein is a uh, cultural critic for the New York Times. He writes a great deal about obscure and unusual museums. This was an article about this museum, Vent Haven. And I know nothing about ventriloquism. Now I know a little bit. Oh, really? A little, <laughs> a little bit. bit. A little you, bit. You saw 700 ventri uh, what do you call them? Dummies. Dummies, or they're also called ventriloquial figures. Re ventriloquial figures. I thought it was yeah. easier to say dummies. But yeah, you, there's is. 700 in that museum, there's right? Or more. There are 700 in the museum, a few more in their storage spaces. Anyway, I saw the article. I didn't really know what these were, but there was a photograph also by Mr. Rothstein in the paper, and these faces in the photograph fascinated me. I didn't really know what they were. I just said, what is that? Because I'm a person who's attracted to faces more than anything. Oh, right, because, well, you do portraits. And these are portraits. These are, this is really interesting, the way you've done it. How did you choose the cover? Well, first of all, did you get permission to go in and of take the? It was a long process. First of all, the museum is very small. It's in a little house and two <laughs> other cottages. Uh, it is run by the descendants of the original founders. It's very much of a family operation. It's quite professional, but it, it's very small and very intimate. Uh, and they don't have a huge funding. Uh, it's not the Smithsonian. Right. Uh, but they're only open by appointment, only during certain months of the year, because they actually um, they can't really fund the heating of the house during the winter months, oh, et cetera. My. So uh, uh, I made an appointment after several months. Uh, of course, I talked to the people and corresponded with them. was all over their website for quite a while. Went there just on a scout to see it. Went back a second time to see it. Took snapshots of uh, the figures that I liked. It was almost like casting. Oh my gosh, they're so scary. We have to look. They're very scary to me. First I didn't of find all, them scary at I all. love the way you did it because you, there's a light in the eyes. They look like they're looking at you, like in a in a very weird way. Were there any women ventriloquists at yes, all? Yes, there are. A handful. Or did the men use women? Could the men use women dummies? Yes. First of all, the history of ventriloquism uh, is very diverse. It, you could even say that it's ancient because channeling the human voice through an object, I think, goes back to shamanism. I, I'll tell you, I, you could look at this all night long, but the thing is for someone like you to t talk about your vision of what you saw, how you chose the cover, how would you choose that? Actually, I didn't choose the cover. Oh, well, who uh, did the back? Or the back. That's Tango Teddy, by the way. <laughs> um, and the front cover is Barnaby. Barnaby. Yes. Uh, in a way, I, I th kind of think of them as, uh, as sort of the mother and father of the tribe. Oh, oh that's, that's exactly Even right. Even though Tango Teddy is not a female figure, he's but, a man. But, he, but she looks like the mother. She does, in a way. And I think everyone has to go out and get this. Thank you. The cover was selected by my publisher and my designer in collaboration with me. And, uh, you know, I've worked with some uh, wonderful people. Suzanne Slazen is the publisher. Oh, I know. She's great. She's fantastic. And Sam Shahid, who is a really well-known creative director who's designed most of Bruce Weber's books. Right. Uh, quite a few books for Ross Blechner and many you other artists. You worked with Carr, too. Yes. I was really, really fortunate to have Sam. And, and that's why you came today. Because we go back so far. Thank you, Matthew. Pleasure. <laughs>
<laughs> and thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com, and we'll see you next time.